All right, so I have it set up so that it, all of you can talk if you choose to. So I have unmuted you all. If you do have questions, <clears throat> there's also a chat and a questions bar. Um, so we can see questions. We're not going to do any polls, but it'll definitely be the way it is. Hopefully everybody can hear me all right. This is the Rhino Carbon Fiber Pools and Slabs repair on this. Um, and I'll get started. Just as a brief history of Rhino Carbon Fiber, we were established in 2001 by Robert Luke Seacrest. Many of you know Luke. That's him and his brother, Doug. They're uh, replacing a basement wall. We hope we don't see too many of those, right? So uh, they started in 2000, and it was originally two employees, as you can see, Doug and Luke, at $100,000 in sales, and they rose up to $4 million. It's 50 employees. Um, and now Rhino Carbon Fiber, five years later, does over $13 million in sales annually. Uh, like I said, we were founded in May 2000. Uh, we adopted CFRP into the business. Advanced Basin Products was formed and Rhino Carbon Fiber was formed after that. There were patents in the U.S. and, and Canada and actually internationally now. Um, uh, Canadian owned by ADT Products, Inc. We actually are part of a big family with Drycore, Barricade, Rhino, and Insel Armor, all under AGT. Uh, some of the things people don't know, carbon fiber isn't new, new, new. Uh, it's been around since 1879, and Thomas Edison accidentally invented it uh, when he was trying to create filaments for early light bulbs. Uh, he said it was a horrible way to make a light bulb that was really strong, and they started using it. First applications on a building are in the 50s, was actually used on a bridge in Switzerland by a guy named Urs Meyer. Urs was doing a bunch of research and he put it on there and it's still actually on the bridge. Bridge is still standing. They've replaced the structural steel, I believe six times now. So jumping right into slabs, um, we see a bunch of different kinds of slab damage um, and repair conditions and not all of them are exactly what you think they are. So, for instance, here in the uh, upper right uh, side of this, or upper left, sorry, let's start at the upper left, post-tension slab alert. This is actually a post-tension slab where the tenon, one of the tensioning tenons had snapped. Uh, it actually created a slab damage that went all the way through the entire time. This is punching shear. Um, as you can see, the columns are still here. They kind of punched through. Um, that's something that we see quite commonly. Let me back up. I actually might up here. We see a lot of this. Uh, hopefully we catch it in the early stages where we can carbon fiber reinforce over these to prevent it and reinforce for it. Um, I bet you've all seen this. This is what we call bloom or rebar. A rebar pop, delamination. Uh, there's a bunch of different names for it. Um, this is a typical parking structure kind of damage that we see. Lots of water coming in, causing damage to the upper slabs. Those slabs then have bird bird ponds or pools, and those little pools will cause an extreme amount of weight to weight up above them. Um, this is not actually a slab, except that it is in that on the other side of this wall where this cold joint is, it goes across, there's actually a slab on the other side they reinforced for, um, but they didn't count on was that this slab on the other side would get traffic on it as much as it did and it actually caused the wall to warp and snap um, this is standard parking structure um, as you can see in here this is this typical kind of slab crack repair things that we see uh, you see them hundreds of times a day i guarantee you go to every parking structure um, this is the underside of an apartment walkway in right outside the university of south uh, southern california uh, we were there with a wonderful company looking at some decking and they have a whole bunch of this that's going wrong and it was just four inch deck rebar mat and it got water saturation through it started the rebar to bloom and the whole deck has been compromised um, as a result and this is a another building we had looked at that had pretty massive spall uh, for those of you who are in Canada we just did one at a salt mine so uh, typically, the slab repairs come in a couple different flavors. They either want to see us do flexural reinforcement, which is what you see down here on the bottom of this slab, 
or they'll ask us to do a shear reinforcement like this, which is typically like a horseshoe, or a combination of flexural and shear, which is this one. So this one actually has these horseshoes on it, but it also has a long piece of carbon that goes all the way down the bottom of this ridge um, on, underneath the carbon here, and it actually gives it flexural support as well, well as shear. So it's kind of a cool combination for both. Um, I know this isn't all slab when you're looking at it, but it almost always goes together. Slab strengthening will very often go with beam strengthening. It's very rare for us to do one without the other. We increase the slab strength, but we don't take into account the beams. It can cause a lot of problems. Um, there are a couple different applications that we see typically that cause us to have to go back in and look. Um, obviously, structural damage, fire damage, uh, reinforcement of corrosion, all that stuff. You see that on almost everything. Commercial, residential, doesn't matter. What you don't see a lot of are change of use giving an increased loading. Um, for us, most recently, that's been a bunch of buildings that were deemed inadequately designed for snow loads and for things like that. Because a couple of years ago, New York had an incredibly, incredibly wet winter. And as a result of that really wet winter, it caused damage. So uh, they're going back now and saying, okay, well, let's make it so our roofs can take this and we can give them a carbon fiber solution, bonding it to steel, bonding it to concrete so we can get them all the extra reinforcement they need. So one of the things that, one of the reasons we brought this up was unidirectional is something we talk about all the time. You'll see, you'll hear us say uni, uni, uni. All that means is the strength is needed in one direction. So it's a one direction weave. That means carbon fiber only goes in one direction. It's generally used for flexural, although sometimes it's used as stirrups for, for shear, but it's very rare. Um, beam slabs, columns, piers, and walls. Um, slabs are us, walls are us. So like I said, um, this is a, a bi-directional for carbon fiber on this. I know it says uni, but that's actually, that's a uni roll. But these columns are typically done with a bi-directional carbon fiber because the engineer wants to also have the crack mitigation if it's possible. So coming up to crack locks, and this is what most of you guys want to talk about is the crack locks. Um, it's minimally invasive, stitch cracks back together, it's non-corrosive, so most of your repairs you guys are using that they have used in the past, that's rebar, metal stirrups, torque locks, things like that, they all have an issue, and primarily that's because they corrode. Uh, lately, this has been our our uh, our big entry into a market for pools. Uh, what you're looking at here is them installing a thing called a torque lock. As you can see, it's a single pin, and then over here on this side of the device, there's a a head you have to turn and torque into position to put a pressure across this bar to tension it so that it will pull. Uh, I can tell you from an engineering standpoint. All it does is strain the concrete, and these are these are steel, so they're going to corrode within you know a month or two. They're going to start losing their strength. They are also pretty labor consumptive, as I understand it. You have to chip out this whole area right here, get down through the gunite all the way down, then chip down into more, drill two large holes, and then socket these in with a crack lock. It's six to eight minutes of repair it's very fast uh crack locks are also 130 dollars for 20 of them torque locks are 440 dollars for 10. Uh, so there's a difference there uh, this is a bent staple rebar um bent rebar that's usually bent at the corners and stuck in the crack thinking that the rebar will go back where the rebar was messed up um it's it's pretty bad uh, i don't like the idea at all uh, one of the reasons I don't is because you know it's going to corrode. Even when you minute, you put it in the ground and put it in contact with concrete and water, it's going to corrode. So it, it's what failed before. I don't know why I would want to do it again. Um, what's funny is I think this is actually Luke's garage, uh, but what you're seeing here are carbon fiber staples, um, and you see them. They go in. Carbon fiber staples take a lot of a lot more labor than a standard crack lock. 
uh, but you put them in and you notch them down and they're pretty much, they disappear. Some of you have already used carbon fiber staples. Uh, some of you haven't. It's completely up to you guys. This is actually a carbon fiber staple that's put into a footer before they lift it. So they were doing peering and they discovered this chunk of footer they were going to peer off of was detached. So they came in and they put carbon fiber staples across it based on the engineer's, engineer's recommendation so that when they lift, this piece can't move again, which is nice. Uh, compared to the carbon fiber staple, it's much faster to put in. There's less concrete remo removed, which means you use less epoxy and you have a much higher strength repair, primarily because everything's linear. So you don't have an issue with the uh, bend in a staple is where the weakest point is. So when it starts to pull, it'll actually create a shear plane there. You can get a cutting uh, through the carbon sometimes. And as you all know, carbon fiber is super strong in tension, but when you put it in shear, it has to be specifically designed for that, so that can cause problems. This is the video on how to do the crack locks. Um, I highly recommend if you haven't seen it before, just take a second and peek. So that's basically our little 30 second elevator pitch on the concrete crack lock. Um, as many of you have seen them, um, I like I said for the this one. So all of these we have, we can have them made for you. I don't know why it won't let me step past. There we go. Um, this is uh, the actual installation video. So this actually explains the entire, and like I said, all of these YouTube videos are available for you. And just don't use blowing air. This is actually an install video, which I think is awesome.
So this is actually them after that install. Now, I, I love that video. It's great fun because it shows them using it really fast. But if you notice, her shirt started out yellow and ended up gray. So try and work a little cleaner, but it looks great. I mean, this is one of the installs they did. This is actually in Australia. So this is the Ohio Department of Transportation. And they used our crack locks to fix a recently poured on-ramp. And as that on-ramp was going, uh, they ran into a problem where they had some cracks that showed up. Now this is a major stress point. So what we ended up doing was putting more than one crack lock, four of them as a matter of fact, inside that crack. So the it went down, I believe eight inches and they were staggered every two coming up. Um, so they were down there pretty deep and it gave the engineers the opportunity to put reinforcement exactly where they wanted it, exactly how they wanted it so that it came up perfect. Uh, you'll also notice our tough wipes, which are in this picture. I know I talk about them all the time, but they are a lifesaver. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was finished right here. Uh, they came back over it and then they tar, as a matter of fact, they came back over and sealed it over the top. Uh, when they were done and you couldn't even tell it was there so it was a really good job this is actually a cool one this was two slabs that came together on a house uh, they put a durable flooring on it with a mastic presentation and this hardwood popped off the floor every time this expansion joint moved and they had the expansion joint that went this way but they had an extra one here in the middle of the floor they could figure out so we locked it together with the crack lock uh, it kept the floor from moving again, and then they came back over it later on and put the hardwood floor back down and worked perfectly. As you can see, there's an expansion joint in this concrete slab right here. And then what happened was we had so much thermal expansion and contraction around this window that it actually started a crack in the middle of the window, went back over here to it. But as you can see, we had to stitch this whole section back together. And the engineers helped them figure out spacing and how to modify what it does so we can make sure that they got covered for it. Um, we modified the layout a little bit too. And this is the bread and butter for a lot of the people who listen to these phone calls is that deck repair. This is an artisanal, artisanal concrete stamp repair or stamp presentation over the top. Um, this company in particular, they specialize in very, very high end uh, pool decks and they weren't even doing some that had cracks in them because they couldn't put a guarantee or warranty on their top coat and because they couldn't their clients were very reluctant to invest you know a quarter of a million dollars in in concrete decoration and concrete topping to know that in a year it'll crack to come through they put a bunch of crack locks in there i believe they put in something on the order of like 400 of them um, this is a different pool structure, um, but it just shows you that they made the engineer change the layout and made it so that it had to look in a specific pattern. They created a nice template for you to be able to use. I recommend using templates. In the beginning, I would use plywood um, to do it. I know in the video that they show you, um, it shows it shows them using uh, a saw, cutting it, and then doing the holes using a half inch drill bit. As it turns out with the epoxy, uh, we've been using a 5 8 inch drill bit going down a minimum of half an inch. Uh, I prefer going down three quarters of an inch so you're slightly below the ground. And then we do this, the drill and then the saw second. Uh, and that way it keeps you from breaking bits. We found that when you saw first and then you go back in and try and drill on top of it, the little wings on the end of the masonry bits, they'll catch and sometimes they'll snap the bits, so that's not good. Um, these are what those displays look like. That temple looks like when it's laid out. As you can see, it's four crack locks here. There's a spacing for crack locks. We didn't determine the spacing. An engineer who was on site in discussion with our engineers uh, figured this out. So it's a little weird, but it, the engineer determined that he wanted to have spread the reinforcement out in a specific way to keep it from cracking ever again. So that's what we did. And this is what that repair actually looks like when it was done because they laid a subsurface in there and then they scarified it before. They came back over with a skim coat and they skim coated the entire thing. And as you can tell, you can't see the, any of the repair at all. 
Um, this is actually another thing that we do in pools quite often is somebody's done a penetration into a pool deck. As you can see, that penetration has caused a part of the pool, the decking itself, the overhang and the coping to start to crack and delaminate. Uh, so we went back in and repaired it from the top down, looking down. Um, and there's, this is actually a pool. It's not my pool, but my pool actually has six of them in there um, going down the wall as well. Um, I use Quartzscape. This was a Pebble Tech pool. But as you can see, it's a much faster installation. These are the cracks they were presented with when they opened up the wall look like this. You're talking about four to six minutes for each one of these cracks to drill them out. You lay them out with a template, you drill them out, you cut them, you drill them out, you cut them, you go down. You don't have to chase the crack down like this as wide as they did with this one. Like you see, they use the V-notch and open it up. You don't have to. Um, if you have loose, like in here, this section right here, I would have probably packed that with hydraulic cement or some kind of repair mortar. And that's after the repair is done and complete. As you can see, there was a patch over here they had to replace, a patch over here they had to replace. And then my favorite thing of all time is a tough wipe. And I recommend these for you guys when you guys are doing these kinds of repairs, uh, especially if you have big crews, lots of tools, you know how that stuff works. It gets really expensive very fast. So what we're trying to do is make it so that you guys aren't aren't uh, having to buy new tools all the time. Uh, don't get me wrong, we'd love to sell them to you, but it's kind of a bummer. The tough wipes are a non, they're a non-toxic, fully organic solvent. Um, you can clean your tools, your hands, takes off epoxies, resins, grease, oil, a lot of stuff. Uh, I have a friend who who will challenge me with something. We'll send him some tough wipes and he'll go after it and see what he does. Uh, last time it was a competition smoker um, that they were using for some kind of display. It had a bunch of creosote and stuff on it. Tough wipes took it right off. Um, as you can see with the tough wipes using your bare hands, um, it tastes horrible, but it is is not toxic, so you can eat it. I don't recommend it at all, ever, never. So as you can see, this is actually tar. I actually used it recently to take roofing tar off of my driveway. Um, so I know it works great there. And the biggest benefit to you is that it doesn't damage your tools. So you're talking about, obviously, it'll if you rub on it enough, you can take paint off. But one of the things about it is those power guns, um, it's really good for methyl cryolates. If any of you have to deal with the paints they put on the roadways, um, it'll take methyl cryolates off before they cure. Um, and then that's it for slabs and pools. What kinds of questions do you guys have? You're all very quiet. Hello, Josh. I didn't see you in there. Hey, Josh. Yeah, hi. I'm oh, sorry. Um, one second. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, sorry. We can all yeah. hear you. Let's see, who else do I recognize in here? I saw Dalton's name up in here. Yeah, I think you unmuted me. I thought I was still muted. Yeah, I unmuted everyone. Yeah, oh. right. Does anyone have any questions? You guys should be able to unmute yourself. I know Dalton's unmuted. Gary, you're in, you're unmuted. Okay, this is Jim with Granite Foundation Repair. Hey, how you doing, Jim? Fine. You talked about the um, crack block being like $120 for 30, and then you talked about another item. There was something for 10. Yeah, so with a, the it's 130 for 20 of them, um, which is 20 linear feet of crack repair. 
my one of my competitors is uh, actually a company called Torque Lock. Four hundred forty dollars for ten. Um, which kills me, but it is what it is. Hi, can can you hear me? Uh, Sanjeev, I can. Oh, this is Carl from Fix and Build. Well, hello. How are you? I I have I have a number of um, chimneys, uh, stucco chimneys that are cracking, and I li I live in Laguna Hills, California. And is there anything for um, like maybe four by uh, four by three foot? chimneys stucco where you would be able because it's cracking i've got vertical cracks going down is there any kind of strapping that you have for those well you can't you can't do it through the over the stucco you'd have to go through the stucco to the base concrete right but you can yeah we can use a you can do a circumferential wrap um hold on i'll show you I mean, it would just basically be another column repair. Um, it would look like this. this okay. Is column and that, strengthening. And that's applied by the uh, like a epoxy. You just you 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 basically just um, you just put it on and you put the wrap around that. Yeah, that's it. That's pretty much what you do. Okay. I got one more question. Um, on the when you're doing a vertical i noticed in the pool you're doing vertical uh stitches does the epoxy pour out uh is it is it self-leveling epoxy or does it just stay in there the anchoring epoxy is pretty thick it's okay. thick and saturant um, you just have to stay on top of it until it starts setting up. yeah it when you when you do it let me see if i can get a good picture um it, it looked like it might come out. That's why I was nervous. Well, it, it doesn't. It does self-level to a degree, but it's the thickest. It's the thickest one we have. It ends up being kind of very gray. I do, I do recommend if you're going to have it out here, like on this application, they topped it with another piece with some more concrete. So show the picture of your pool. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, right like there. Okay. So my question, you shoot it into these cracks, and then you put crack lock in there, and then you shoot it in over the crack itself um, on your ambient temperatures, but it, it doesn't really sag that much. Okay. Um, now, do you do you put the uh, uh, the epoxy in first, and then you put the rhino straps in, and then put uh, epoxy over it, so it's basically it's yeah. laid there. Yeah, that's what you do. Okay. Um, and to be honest with you, when you put the epoxy in and put the con the concrete crack lock in, if the epoxy all ran out, the the concrete crack lock won't move uh, once it's placed because those buttons that are on the end, those little nods you see, right? They're actually a mechanical lock. So when the concrete crack lock slides into that hole, and you drive and we recommend that you dry fit all your holes before you go to place a crack lock in there because it can cause problems with you. Um, when you go to, if you forget to place it. Are you guys coming up with like a plastic template for the drills? Cause that, that's the only thing that seemed to take me time is getting it accurately drilled. It seems like I'm always off by uh, an eighth of an inch or so. I have a metal one. Um, we had one made out of A10. Okay, good. That's what. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Because most of the time when we're drilling on them, the guys are going and then they hit them and they got the drill down. But what we were doing was putting the metal template down and spraying through it with parking lot paint. It turns bright yellow. Um, but it's that way you just tell your guys everywhere that's painted we need you guys to drill. Um, but I, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. So you so you're mocking it at each point. Okay. Yeah, that way you can have a guy you could have whoever wants to do your layout your layout for you. They can go out and they can lay it out. Somebody comes behind them and drills. Somebody else comes by and drills and then cuts. And then before 
do the carbon, you use a vacuum to pick it all up. Now remember, the biggest thing you can do and the one thing that people cause the largest problems with is you can't put compressed air on concrete once you grind on it or cut on it or drill on it. When you use compressed air, the compressed air takes the pulverized concrete and it back into the fines. It blows those fines back in, locks off the pores. So when you go to put a put epoxy down or anything else down the walls, floor, slabs, columns, whatever, the concrete fines are blocking it. So what you're bonding to is the concrete dust, not the concrete itself. So vacuum is, is, the, is the key. Yeah, you have, to, you have to use a vacuum. I know that um, the, the recent changes that are coming out are saying not to use compressed air. I'm on that committee for polymers and polymer bonding uh, with the American Concrete Institute. And I know that it's coming because we just approved the minutes uh, last week or week before last. So the way that, that specification used to say you could use oil-free oil -free compressed air, but we stopped them from doing that because we were finding that a lot of the polymer systems are not bonding as well out somebody did a study at the University of Tennessee and they determined that it was because the microfines were blocking the pores and concrete so the epoxy couldn't bond as well as it should oh okay I got one more question and I'm, I'm done uh, I'm looking at the spacing sometimes I see six six inches sometimes I see eight twelve is there any rule of thumb on every Wait. six inches oh. if it's a a, okay, so if it's a normal deck, uh, non-load bearing, you're not driving trucks or tractors or anything crazy on it, um, 12 inches is fine. Uh, four in a residential house, 12 inches is fine. If you're going to be doing it near a driveway, anywhere where you're going to be moving things, um, we can get down to 10 inches, and in a pool, we recommend eight inches apart. Um, okay. Anything else that you have or questions that you have on that, you're more than welcome to submit to us. Um, I believe I have some guys in this call right now that have sent me pictures. So those pictures are worth a thousand words. You can call me and say, hey, Johnny, I just sent you a picture of whatever, and we can look at it because that's important. Right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so Lenny asked, if what happens if the contractor does not use epoxy, just patches with cement? So you'll cause the reason that you want to use the epoxy is because it puts the carbon into tension immediately. If you put the if you put the back up in there, you lock them into place mechanically, you don't have any of the advantages that you get from having the epoxy in there. One of the having epoxy in there is it immediately goes into tension, deposits the carbon thing is you don't want to get the car allow the carbon while you're back filling it with something else to start janking around in there and getting off angle um, you get a piece of aggregate that crushes it and it causes damage um, I recommend epoxy every single time um, we've only well we've never installed without epoxy so I recommend epoxy every single time anyone else have any other questions let me call you out Dalton so um i if I got any other questions Excuse well me. i got one you make you're making me start to think a little bit okay let's That's say the idea. Have, okay let's say you have a deck with um like um eight inch um cement columns like a, a typical residential deck and that's starting to crack from the rebar so you could you could basically wrap that with that carbon fiber material Yes. Do you, have, do you have to put uh, uh, metal tensioners on the outside of it, or is it just the wrap itself would, would hold it together? No, the wrap itself will hold it together. And you can send it to us, and we can have the engineer draw it up for you so you can submit to your clients. Okay, that's good. Yeah, okay. I do that kind of column reinforcement all the time. So, yeah, it's I love the product. Uh, the crack locks are awesome. I spent a lot of time in a lot of time 
in a bunch of different applications. And the crack lock seems to be the one that people grab the easiest and they understand it and they can run with it. Um, this, this you see that's on the screen, that's currently on the screen, he charges $100 a linear foot for crack repair. Yeah, that's a good question. I was going to ask, what is the going rate for that? So it's a hundred. So he charges hundred. As long as it's structural crack repair, he can charge up to about hundred dollars. It's typically between seventy-five and a hundred dollars a foot for crack repair. Um, and, and in decks like this, you're talking about these people are looking at putting on a quarter million dollars of over deck. That means they're going to have this stamped concrete with an artisanal. I actually went to a location where they were doing it, and it much fun to watch um, because uh, they this this older gentleman came out with a whole the little cart that had a bunch of little pots on it and he stamped they stamped the concrete for him and then about three or four hours later you could walk on it but it was still a little soft and he went over it with these brushes and pigments and things like that and it looked like stone when he was done but you're talking about a quarter million dollars worth of topping they're putting this concrete slab and so when it cracks it kills them yeah that's Crack what i i mean yeah, it's, what's the guarantee on this let's say this you do the surface and then 10 years later you call back it cracks i mean if it does i'm, I'm i just it won't crack it can't i'm old i'm old school I'm, I'm old school so i'm looking at it's amazing that carbon fiber is that strong because there's a lot of tension on, especially in these pool decks, or if they want a hill or a slope, where there's a lot of that movement going on. Right. So and you're in Laguna, right? Yeah, Laguna Hills. Yeah. So by way of Boston, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's my Laguna Hills accent. So. Yeah, I can tell. I grew up in Corona, <laughs> so that's not Laguna Hills. Anyway, so I, grew um, up, I grew up in the beautiful town of Dorchester. Yeah, I would have never guessed. <laughs> and for all those of you that are on the call, the, if somebody ever sounds like Boston and you can't tell if they're from Boston, ask them to say one word. You ready? It's how do you say W O R C E S T E R? It's um, it's a town outside of Boston. Yeah, say it again. It is not. It ain't Worcester unless you're not from there. Oh, Worcester. Okay. Worcester. No, it's Worcester. 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 Yeah, it's Worcester. Yeah. So, so yeah, like an English from that area, area, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm from yeah. Boston. All right, spell this word or say this word. If it's Worcester, then you're in." So, well, how, uh, about, how about a Canadian? All you have to say is, "Can you just say out for me?" Uh, I'm hey. not Canadian. I'm from Tucson, Arizona, but okay. Uh, no, but hey, hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeffrey can do it. Um, so Jeffrey, you asked if there's any problem shipping Canada. As a matter of fact, no, there's not. It's actually pretty easy for us. We have a warehouse in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, over on Royal Windsor Drive. And so we're from Canada all the time. Um, most of the northeastern and northern United States, uh, northern United States, we get shipped from Canada because it's faster, but we ship from uh, Heath, Ohio, which is about 45 minutes east of Columbus for the United States. Um, some stuff ships out of Tucson where I uh, have I'm the, I don't know if I introduced myself or not. My name is Johnny Rice. I'm the district manager, district sales manager for Rhino Carbon Fiber for the southern United States. I take over the southwestern U.S. and the southeastern U.S. Um, who's not on the call today, uh, Mike Crater, he's the Midwest and Northeast. A gentleman who is on the call today is named Josh. Uh, Josh is on it. He's got all of Canada. God help us all and him. It's a long, long trek. Across Canada. Um, so yes, Jeffrey, we do definitely get in and out of there without a problem. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, who's the quite who's the rep for uh, California or um, me? That area? You. That'd okay, be me. Cool. Okay, I get yeah, one more question. This is a question yeah. that kind of uh, there was a I I got a call for a customer. Um, they had uh, ceramic tile in their living room and the side of the. It's a uh, town called Aliso Viejo, and the the hill, it was built by Shea Homes, and uh, a good portion of the condos are kind of slipping down the hill a little bit. Okay. And so I got the call in on that, let's say it was a Monday. I go home at night, I turn on my YouTube, and you come up. 
And that just freaked me out because I'm saying to myself, is AI that good where they're actually, they can actually know what you're looking for, for uh, concrete reinforcement? Does that just pick up and then they automatically send you a, a, an ad? Yeah, well, we, we are very highly placed with SEO. So because, well, Rhino Carbon Fiber represents 40% of all carbon fiber sold in all residential. So we took my next two competitors and added them together. We sell more than them. Okay. But it just so seems funny. No, but it just seemed like they were actually listening to my texting. And there's, oh, yeah, hey, we can help you. And it just seemed like it was really, I came back the next morning with the customer said, I found your solution. It was like, oh. And she goes, how yeah. did you find that? I said, I don't know. They called, they texted me. It was, it was. Yeah, really we, we actually have been secretly bugging your phone for years. <laughs> Why? Because so, I'm a Patriot um, fan? Okay. Yeah. We're, uh, we're definitely not, we're not a uh, secret about it, I guess, anymore. Yeah. Uh, we've been out to get you guys. So here's one of the things that we have in here. If you go look at handouts, uh, we have the cell sheet for the crack locks and we have the full deck sheet for the crack locks also in there i recommend it and pool decks you guys those are those pool decks make you a ton of money i mean this job that's in here we're looking at he did 400 linear feet he charged forty thousand dollars and it literally took him five days and the longest part of the entire install wasn't the carbon fiber crack locks it was the artisanal overlay afterwards um, yeah right yeah i mean there was a like i'm not kidding you i would love to be this guy it's he's he's this very quiet calm apparently half chinese and half mexican um and his dad was some kind of artist and he's just got a talent for it and it's wild to watch no it's it's, it's, it's the fake stone look it's like they uh yeah seen, but yeah they, yeah he's crazy i've never seen anybody do it before in person until this guy and well, if you go along, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Riverside County on the way to on the 91, they have this pattern on the on the cement walls. It's it looks like it's Jurassic type stone that they yeah. put up, and it just uh, it, you have to stare at it. You just can't because there's no repeat. You, you know, you're trying to find a repeat there, and it's just it's amazing. It really is, and that's the that's what's that's that's the, the new stuff that's coming out. They just but if you have something where we can we can guarantee the customer that 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 movement is is stopped. We've stopped the movement. Now you can put whatever you want on it to prevent any type of exterior cracking. I, that's awesome. I, I you know I'm, yeah, I'm we excited do. We about your product. Um, yeah, I would say that you can definitely say that without a doubt. The thing you may end up happening though is I don't know how you guys are, but here in, here in Arizona set of cracks and then I make it a crack somewhere else in the thing and it has to do with it, for primarily for us it has to do with uh damage to the slabs from thermal expansion and contractions they spread the crack somewhere else um away from where you repaired but right. I can't tell yeah when um, you say, when you say thermal expansion are you talking about just the the heat of the uh, surface is just expanding and, and causing the crack? Yes, yes. What happens is the heat of the sun hitting it acts like a solar panel. And so it will um, uh, We do have a lot of questions regarding that. Go ahead, ask your questions. Yeah, with just uh, wondering like for seismic uh, so basically everything in British Columbia is or has to be earthquake um, rated, let's say, in the lower mainland of British Columbia, which is around Vancouver area. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. So uh, do you, if people are asking with respect to, um, you know, can this perform? I see you have a lot of lateral um, type of Obviously, the cracks happen from the lateral movement, but once you once you stitch them, um, can they perform under that aspect? Yeah, have they mm -hmm. snapped? In other words, correct. Have I ever had one snap? Um, we've never had one fail. However, if if you think that you may have, sorry about that. If you think that you may have a 
a hard shear condition that it, as in you, you think this can shift in such a way that it will create a shear condition we have engineers on staff all the time and we can have them review your specific see if we can find one that works for you now are they bigger than 12 inches uh, obviously there's no 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 they're only just the one we only they only come in the one size and I think they're 14 inches, believe it, believe it or not. I think they're not quite 12 or they're a little bit more. Okay. But I'll have to ask the engineer because I know they were changing up some of the sizing to get better strength. So so if we, sorry, if we send you a, a request that has some kind of a seismic um, requirement, you, you'll review that and then respond, yeah? Of course. Fabulous. And for the American people out there, um, only it's only in Eastern Canada that they have a funny accent when they say out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are practically from Seattle. I don't want to hear anything from Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we, we barely even have an accent out here. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. that's true. I can hear the out right there. You just already said it, so. <laughs> this, is, this, is Jim. this is Jim again in Texas. Yo, What's up, Texas? Okay, okay. here we go. <laughs> um, question on expansive clay soils you fix the crack and the soil flexes and seems you're gonna get the crack again it might crack somewhere else you might translate the crack is what it's called you might translate the crack somewhere else but it, generally um no uh generally we don't have that issue okay Guys, I'm, I'm from Oklahoma. My name's Gary Hanshu, and I have seen a lot of slab stitching where they go in, and, and like Jim just said, with expensive soil, where it has been stitched previously is always, I've never seen one crack. Now, four or five inches out past the stitch, I've seen it snap right there, multiple. So what you can see in this, like the one that I left up here, the reasons I, I leave these kind of displays up on this one. If you see that there's the crack comes through this area, but he puts crack locks in the field. That's an engineer. An engineer went back in there and said, "Hey, you know what? I think we're going to be seeing come some kind of a a display." And they arrange they change the arrangement of the crack locks to fit that. Um, and again, I have a I have I have uh, some engineers that'll help us out with that if that gets to be a question. Uh, if you've got an unusual seismic condition, uh, if you have an unusual, I mean, really, an unusual seismic condition, you have a weird shift, soil shift, some weird shear, something that you want to deal with, call us so we can make sure that we get you the exact kit you need. Okay, I got a, I got one more question. I'm trying not to ask all the questions, but on on the columns, will you wrap it with this uh, carbon fiber? Okay, and then you know, obviously you use an epoxy base to, to adhere it to the concrete. Uh, now, how does how does paint take to that? If you have to paint it, uh, the typical concrete gray or whatever. Latex. So, if you're gonna do painting on it, you can do that. It's not a problem. You want to make sure that you're painting it within 24 hours with an epoxy based paint, um, like so on these columns. So it has to be an epoxy based paint to put on. Well, here's the thing. If you don't use an epoxy based paint, bonding anything to epoxy that isn't epoxy is difficult. I would recommend that you bond 12 hour, within 12 hours. I'm sorry, to rephrase that. I would recommend that you bond epoxy paints with UV retardants 12, 12 to 24 hours after the initial application. Because you're still within a gel state on the epoxy yeah so is the epoxy coming through the carbon fiber is that what's happening yeah when you do this kind of an application you're dealing with a primer coat you're dealing with a base coat of epoxy that's typically i'm going to say it in mils because it's how i know it um you have a primer coat that's 10 to 15 mils thick. you'll have an epoxy base coat that's 15 mils thick 45 to 60 mils of carbon fiber, and then 15 to 20 mils of top coat. That's how the process works to create an encapsulated composite. And then that's all there is to it, really. 
and then we top coat. Now, if you're going to top coat it with with a parge, plaster, concrete, like when you're doing it in pools, I recommend having a little bucket with some playground sand on there, and you, as soon as it gets thumbprint tacky, pat the playground sand into the epoxy to give yourself a really good biting surface. Some people have an issue with trying to bond uh, plaster, or concrete, and things like that over epoxy. It's slippery. So when you try and skim coat it, it can be a real pain in the neck. So that's what I recommend. Sounds like somebody got a diner back there. I like that. Now I'm getting hungry for breakfast, though. So um, does anybody have any other questions? I, I think I got it. I'm good with it. So, right. and to everybody out there, let's hope this thing gets over quickly. You know, stay healthy. Yep. That's what you can do, right? Yeah, so all we can do. But I tell you one thing, I'm, I'm going out of my mind. It's just, I'm, I'm getting cabin fever like they wouldn't believe it. Just. Here's the thing about that I want you guys to know. And um, what I want you guys to do is stay safe and train. But also, I think for you guys, it's if you can't get in front of your customers, and that's hard to do sometimes, uh, I recommend that you still call them on the phone, check in on them, see yeah. how they're doing, and give them give them the feeling like you know you're there for them no matter what. So it works out. I, I, my guess is that once this is over with, I think we're going to be just uh, deluge of. Uh, of, of people that are just finally deciding to come out of the house and get things done. I think that that's that's my prediction, but I could be wrong. For sure. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a great time. Um, if you have any other questions or anything else we can do for you, by the by all means, just tell us. My contact information is on the is on the webinar invite with Josh. So uh, we're always here to take care of you. Hope you guys have a great, safe day, and I'll talk to you soon.